Americans for Prosperity North Dakota proudly supported important policy improvements that broke barriers for all North Dakotans this legislative session. From tackling unnecessary and burdensome occupational licensing standards to fighting for tax relief, AFP is proud to have played a part in improving the lives of North Dakotans this year. Join AFP today by visiting www.afpnd.org. This advertisement was paid for by Americans for Prosperity. Welcome to the Plain Talk Podcast. I am your host, Rob Port. Later on the show, Senator Kevin Kramer joins us to take your questions and talk about all sorts of things that are going on. Uh, obviously, the uh, the controversy over uh, Labor Secretary Alex Acosta and his past involvement in the Jeffrey Epstein scandal. Uh, Alex Acosta was previously a federal prosecutor, and he uh, cut a deal which resulted in uh, Jeffrey Epstein having to register as a sex offender and plead guilty to felony charges and agree to incarceration for a period of time. Uh, but some people think that that was too light, particularly now that the uh, sort of secretive multimillionaire, maybe billionaire, I guess nobody really knows how rich this guy is. Uh, they, uh, they they feel like Epstein may have let him off yesterday, Epstein defending himself. Senator Kramer weighs in on all that as other people demand on, demand that he, in turn, demand Alex Acosta's resignation. But before we get there, we live in an area where we spend a lot of time talking about fake news. Um, Certainly the news media bristles a lot when President Trump talks about fake news. They talk about how important it is that that, um, you know, we we promote the truth. Uh, Since President Trump got elected, uh, our news media, the journalists have have suddenly rededicated themselves to the idea of reporting the truth. Now, that's sort of ironic for those of us who think that the news media is biased because why weren't you this dedicated to reporting the truth before? I mean, was Barack Obama some paragon of political virtue? I I don't think that's the truth. I'm not even sure most of his most ardent supporters would agree with that. But anyway, that's what they did, and they don't like the fake news thing. But But what happens when the news media themselves promotes fake news? And I'm not talking about you know, ideological bias or anything like that. Sometimes they just report on things that aren't actually a thing. Now, Disney is, um, Disney, which, which by the way, seems to make all the movies. I, I was looking, I was reading this article about how the three most popular movies for like the last five years are all owned by Disney. Yeah, I mean, Disney is a, is a behemoth. Anyway, uh, Disney is doing this thing where they remake their old animated movies with real actors in live action. Um, I guess they've done it with like the Beauty and the Beast and others. I I don't really follow this stuff. Those movies aren't really my cup of tea, but whatever. It's something that they've been doing, and apparently it's very popular. And they're going to be making a live action remake of with with real actors of the Little Mermaid. Now you'll remember. I I think if you had children, the original Little Mermaid was made from. Uh, or, excuse me. Was Ariel in that in that movie was a white girl with red hair. In the live-action remake, they have uh, found a black actor by the name of Haley Bailey to Halle Bailey, maybe. I I hope I'm not mispronouncing her name. Anyway, she's going to play the role of Ariel. Now, if you're a reader of the Washington Post or other media publications, you would probably have seen articles uh, suggesting that there is a widespread backlash to this, that there's people upset that a black actress would be replacing a white character. Only it doesn't really seem to be the truth. There was a viral tweet, right? Uh, somebody posted on Twitter that they were upset about this news, uh, and it uh, it went viral, and a lot of people were condemning it. And I guess there was even a even a hashtag called like "Not My Ariel" or something like that. I I don't know, uh, but a lot of people were responding to it. But it turns out that tweet wasn't even real. It was just some troll. It was a made up account. It was just somebody posting something offensive to get people worked up and you know what it worked in fact it got so worked up that the washington post published not one but two news stories about it and there were all sorts of news stories elsewhere found out about this by reading 
uh, the libertarian uh, publication Reason, Robbie Soav uh, wrote there, I quote, It's true that a few Twitter users seemed genuinely upset about the casting, but the overwhelming majority of the people tweeting hashtag not my Ariel are doing so in support of Bailey and expressing outrage that anyone would be offended by a black Ariel. Their fury is well-intentioned, but largely unnecessary. Well, yeah. But here's the thing. The news media picked this up. The news media reported this as though this were an actual controversy. And you know what? There, there wasn't. There wasn't a controversy at all. Not really. I mean, maybe a few fringe people on the internet were upset about it. But is that news? That somebody somewhere on the internet is upset, upset about something? That's not news. That's, that's like reporting that airplane was land safely right that's a dog bites man that's not news but here's the thing sometimes the news media makes up news sometimes then for for as all the complaining we do about president donald trump and how you know divisive he is and how polarizing he is and that's all true he is divisive he is polarizing that's his style for better or worse but what about when the news media is divisive what about when the news media is polarizing. Remember, it wasn't some obscure, spammy link farm that promoted this controversy. It was the Washington, quote-unquote, democracy dies in darkness post, among others. This is a media publication that, again, has repeatedly bristled when politicians like President Donald Trump talk about fake news. Yet they seem fine when it comes to exaggerating a controversy in order to prop up an argument about racism. Don't you think there's enough actual hatred in the world, enough actual racism in the world that we don't need to invent more? Aren't we already divided enough without having to further divide ourselves? Again, the journalism industry likes to talk about the politicians and how divided they are, and they like to report on all these things as though they weren't a part of the problem themselves. But you know what? They are. My interview with Senator Kevin Kramer, up next. This episode of the Plain Talk podcast is brought to you by Energy of North Dakota. Oil and natural gas from North Dakota strengthens all of America. And through our abundance of talents, innovations, and technologies, energy responsibly produced here translates to worldwide economic stability. With producers and our communities working together, we're securing a sustainable future that generation after generation can build on. It's all happening right now with Energy of North Dakota. Learn more at energyofnorthdakota.com. Senator Kevin Kramer joins me now to take your questions, which I have some uh, submitted. Remember, every week uh, he's on, or most weeks anyway, if you have questions for the senator, you can always email them to me ahead of time, rob at sayanythingblog.com, or if you're following me on social media, Facebook or Twitter, just search for Rob Porter, Say Anything Blog. I put up threads there soliciting questions. That's a way to submit them as well. Uh, And we got some questions this week, but first, before we get anywhere, we got to talk about uh, Secretary of Labor, Alex Acosta, who has with with the high profile, uh, I guess, re-prosecution of Jeffrey Epstein, who is a man uh, he's previously convicted of. Uh, he's a registered sex offender. Uh, he has previously convicted of crimes in the state of Florida, uh, now stands a, a, accused of a much a much broader scope of crimes. And, and there's been all sorts of reporting over the years uh, about his connection to, uh, you know, human trafficking and, and, and pedophilia. And, and I, the federal government is now alleging that they have found, uh, you know, a, a kitty porn, ch- child pornography uh, in his uh, in one of his residences. So, but where Mr. Acosta comes into this, Secretary Acosta, is he was the U.S. attorney covering the state of Florida back in the late 2000s, and he cut a deal with Mr. Epstein in which Mr. Epstein was required to uh, plead guilty to a you know felony counts in the state of Florida to register as a sex offender to pay restitution to victims in exchange for the federal government essentially dropping charges. Now, many are saying that those that action on his part, on Mr. Acosta's part when he was U.S. attorney, was uh, that that he essentially gave Mr. Epstein a pass. Now you have all sorts of people calling for him to step down from the Trump administration cabinet. Where are you at on this, Senator? Sure. A couple of things. First of all, with regard to 
to the secretary and his job as a secretary. I think he's been a very good secretary of, uh, of labor. Um, he, he's not as been as uh, aggressive as some people have wanted him to be in terms of rolling back some of the labor regulations and whatnot. But he's been he's been pretty much right down the middle. He's been very helpful to um, job corps. He's been very helpful to uh, you know the, the trades and to helping change a little bit of the the uh, the policy culture, if you will, as it, as education. Uh, leans more toward MBAs versus, uh, you know, the skills trades and things like that. So I, I, I think he's done a good job. He's also done a very good job on with uh, healthcare in the healthcare arena because he's the person and his under his agency that set up, of course, the association healthcare plans that that I think are one part of the solution to the to the healthcare crisis in our country. That said. I'm not, you know, I think it's important for people to know that all of the things that he's being accused of having done, um, the sweetheart deal, if you will, that, that they call the plea agreement with Jeffrey Epstein back in the late 2008, 2007 time frame, was, um, was all vetted during his confirmation process, you know, way back then. And so there's nothing really new other than the advantage of Epstein still being a, a, even seemingly a worse predator and a, a very, very sick human being in my view. So I think it's, it's important to step back. I think, we, I think it's important that the president's reviewing the entire situation. He's looking into what happened back then. But what's happening today and what the new charges are is that they're hideous, hair, Heinous, terrible, awful. There's no, there's no adjective strong enough to describe it, Rob. But it's all, it's all now being put in the context of, of what happened way back then. And I think we need to put everything in the appropriate context. And if the president and the administration find that something um, equally bad was, was hidden back then, then he should be in a lot of trouble. On the other hand, if, if, look at it and look at the evidence and information that we had at the time that he was uh, a U.S. attorney and come to the conclusion that he probably or he may have made the best deal he could make to still get convictions out of it. Um, we don't have advantage of all that. There's one part of the history, Rob, however, that, that concerns me the most, and that is that, that victims and accusers were not informed. To me, that's the, that's the one piece of this that I'd like to learn more more about. So. Um, you know, right now it's hyper politicized, and I understand that. Uh, but that's why I say I think just step back, review the information. If more, you know, if more is learned about um, the history of it, and he, he, then then Alex Acosta will have to answer to that. In the meantime, you know, let's let justice run its course. Mr. Acosta held a press conference today and addressed some of yeah, this. I don't. I don't know if yeah. you had a chance to see it or not. But essentially, his yeah. a part of his defense was was saying that listen, uh, Mr. Epstein, Mr. Epstein was this was essentially a state crime. And and I've had I've I've read other people right. defending him on this front. Uh, in fact, I think his second in command back in February wrote a letter to the editor of the Miami Herald, which I referenced in my print column today. But there was a problem where this sort of a crime is typically prosecuted on. The state level, or at least what was known of the crime mm -hmm. at the time, uh, Mr. Epstein was was potentially going to be able to walk away from state level charges, and so w what Acosta is saying is, listen, the position I was in, I didn't have a great federal nexus. His second in command is saying that they were having trouble getting some of the witnesses to cooperate. So essentially, what they did is they went to him and they said, "Plead guilty to these state charges." I'm not sure a lot of people understand that. What he actually pled guilty to was not federal charges. He ultimately pled mm -hmm. guilty to state charges. Was incarcerated at a state facility, or I, I'm not sure "incarcerated" is the right word. I think there's some hard. I think maybe there's some tough questions for some officials in the state of Florida, by the way. Sure. Who, who I mean, because he didn't really actually spend a lot of time in prison. Uh, right. but, but I mean, that, that was the deal he cut plead guilty to felonies at the state level. And, you know, as far as, the, so what his argument is, I, you, you know, I sort of used my power as a federal prosecutor to get him to plead guilty to state level charges that he might've fought or, or might've been able to walk away from anyway. That's his argument. Does that ring true to you? 
Um, it, it, yes, it, it sounds it sounds like everything we've heard, and that's all true. I might add, I believe that Epstein ended up having to um, register as a sex offender as well, which, by right, the way, yes. is, you know. And he had to pay restitution to known to, to the known victims right. at the time. I, it was like six right. figure payouts. I think it was between like a right. hundred and fifty thousand right. to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, something like that. But in retrospect, now knowing what we know since then, that was not nearly enough. But we didn't know all that then, and the prosecutors didn't know all of that then. They didn't know that he was going to go to New York and have a, a even a, a worse crime ring, if you will, and, and abuse even more young people, children and women of all types. I mean, it's a sick, he's a sick, sick human being who seems to have gotten by with uh, things a lot longer than some might because he is powerful and, and wealthy. And that's, that's one of the injustices of our justice system that we've seen that we see that every day in our system. And it's, it's very unfortunate and seemingly unfair and is unfair. Uh, but that said, again, with regard to Alex Acosta, he had a case in front of him at a given time that had the information he had, and he he is making the case that he he got the best deal he could get. Now, if that's not the case, um, I hope somebody will find out and and, uh, and he'll be treated accordingly. But in the meantime, I think we ought to just take a deep breath and, and let the process work. Last question on Epstein. I, it, it seems like a lot of this is is a big surprise politics. Obviously, Democrats are looking yeah. to to get a scalp in the in in the Trump administration. I because sure. let's I mean let's face it, it, it gets very frustrating anytime uh, you know a, a member of the other side finds themselves in a little hot water. There's those knee jerk calls, demands to resign. I don't think those are very mm-hmm. helpful. But even among some conservatives, I'm, I'm reading this was a, a post. Uh, from earlier today on the conservative blog power line. And I mean, they're mm-hmm. coming after Acosta. They're, they're saying, I'm going to quote now from the blog post, unlike Trump and Senate Republicans, Mulvaney uh, re- referring to uh, white house chief of staff, Mick Mulvaney, Mulvaney has direct knowledge of Acosta's performance as labor at the labor department. He knows that Acosta stalled the implementation of important regulatory initiatives and through his agent lied to him about the reason for the delay. So, it, it frustrates me a little bit. If, if Mr. Acosta did something untoward as a prosecutor and, and didn't sufficiently prosecute someone who, who is, is a monster like Jeffrey Epstein, fine. That's fair right. game. But if this is just about, you know, point scoring on a dunking on Acosta because you don't like his politics, either because you're a Democrat and he's a Republican or you're a conservative Republican and maybe you didn't like his approach at the Labor Department, it, it seems shocking to me that people would even bring that up in this context. No, I, I think that's p- part of the problem, uh, Rob. And that's why I said earlier that there are some people who don't think he was aggressive enough or has been aggressive enough at, at labor. I happen to think he's threaded that needle very well. And, and uh, particularly with, when it comes to association health care plans and, uh, and skills training and, and education. You know, as you know, he came out to North Dakota, met with our tribal college presidents. He met with the, the trades folks, trade folks, and, as well as the uh, skills training and education folks in North Dakota. Uh, and, and of course, uh, associations about association healthcare. So I think he's been a very good, um, a very good labor secretary. But yeah, I think it's no big secret that Mick Mulvaney is much more conservative, probably than Alex Acosta, and probably more conservative than Donald Trump. And um, he, he may be seizing on this opportunity to, you know, pile on a little bit. And I agree, that's unfortunate. But um, that said. You know, signing up for government service at this this high a level uh, comes with a, a lot of the the junk you have to put up with. It's unfortunate, but it's it is the kitchen and the heat that comes with it. All right, before we get to listener questions, I got a question about the uh, the debt ceiling. I'm reading a July 8th uh, Washington Post mm-hmm. article uh, saying that the U.S. government, and I'm quoting now, the U.S. government could run out of money to pay all of its bills by early September if Congress doesn't rush to raise the debt ceiling. And this is according to a, a, a think tank, the Bipartisan Policy Center. So I guess their opinion of what's mm-hmm. going on might differ a little bit from what the Treasury Department has to say. But it does certainly seem as though we're coming up on a debt limit increase again. Uh, Congress right. has ever has never not raised the debt ceiling, even though we've played some brinksmanship on that. Uh, but right. uh, but it's I mean it's a little frustrating because I I mean I'm, I'm hearing a lot of talk from Republicans about well you know the tax cuts and the economy's roaring and everything else. Meanwhile, we're set to run a budget deficit that's 
you know, in, in the ballpark of nine hundred billion dollars this year, almost a trillion mm-hmm. dollars, and we're going to have to raise the debt ceiling again. What what are we what what are we going to do to to resolve that situation? I mean, how how do we how do uh, we're obviously going to have to raise the debt ceiling again because it seems unlikely Congress is going to pass anything uh, to to make that unnecessary. So, what do we do, Kevin? Well, there's really nothing Congress can do to make it unnecessary because what the raising the debt ceiling does is it allows you to pay your bills. So, um, without a raising of the debt ceiling, there's no way to pay obligations that are already accrued. It's, it's, it, Never mind future spending. That, that's literally what the debt ceiling does. It allows, you know, just allows the continuing of spending. At the same time, and we say brinkmanship, and why it makes me chuckle a little bit, it's the one thing, it's the one time when sometimes conservatives can get some pay fors or they can get some other policy concessions that help bend that curve a little bit. It is at a time like this when everybody agrees, you, you, you know, you can't default on the government's debt. I mean, Obviously, that'd be irresponsible, and that would that would send our economy into a tailspin. Um, so, so what's happening? And by the way, the, the, so the policy group that you referenced, or the think tank, I think they are pretty much in sync with the Treasury Department. Now, it may, be, may have a difference of weeks, but either way, we we will come up against the debt ceiling, and it'll have to be raised, and it will be raised. I, I don't have any doubt about that. The question is. What what else happens in, in, in concert with that? One thing the members of Congress have gotten really owly about is raising the debt ceiling as a standalone item because then you don't use you don't have any leverage. You don't get any of these concessions, whether it's it's you know, cuts in spending in a program or, or whether it's a uh, you know some revenue issue or some other policy that bends the, the curve. Um, I think what's likely to happen and what's being negotiated right now is that uh, along with a, a debt ceiling being reached in mid-September, remember the end of the fiscal year is September 30th, so we, we don't yet have a budget deal with between the House and the Senate, and the White House addresses the caps on discretionary spending. And so my hope is is that all of those things get rolled into one package so that you can, in fact, use you know, everybody's sort of thing is leverage to get something else that, that deals more responsibly with our, our budget you know, situation. But even that seems elusive right now because the gap between Republicans and Democrats on defense spending and um, other domestic spending is so great, but none of it really deals with the, the overriding issue, and that is mandatory spending, which is you know now approaching, what, 70% of the entire budget. And that's not even touched in, in some of this stuff, Rob. So... We have a lot of a lot of challenges and a lot of problems. Now, the good news is that the, is that the economy has been growing, and that does cushion some of the the problem with the debt. But uh, that can't go on forever either. Well, d- well does it though? I mean, because that was that was one thing in the Washington Post report is they said that that one reason why this problem is what it is is because revenues haven't been meeting expectations from the Treasury Department. So that's one thing. I mean, yes, the economy is growing, but. Revenues aren't meeting projections that, that were put in place by the Treasury Department. Right. So that means that you're going to hear some people talking about tax increases as a means to deal with, um, you know, with the deficit spending. And uh, other people that will say, let's, uh, you know, let's do more to grow the economy. And that helps. And, and, and there'll be all kinds of other solutions that they'll be talked about. But we are now in a divided government. That means that it won't be a one-sided deal. Uh, it'll either be done in a bipartisan way or it won't be done at all. And, um, not get done at all is a, could be a pretty disastrous problem. Via Facebook, Kyle asks, any updates on the proposed Title IX changes from the Department of Education? Remind me what the Title IX changes are that, that they're seeking. You know, I'm, I'm not real 100% certain uh, with um, with what he's asking about, I I, th- I think that there were some changes coming through related to like how campuses were going to handle adjudicating, uh, you know, accusations of sexual assault and, and issues like that on campus. I, I think that was the changes. I, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I don't really have a lot of the specifics sure. outside of the, the question. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know more than I do right now. <laughs> if that's, if that's the, the situation. So we'd have to check on that. That sure. would be a, uh, obviously a DOE issue. Or, and, um, well, let me just look into it and see what's, you know, what the latest stuff is. It, 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 T- Title IX deals with, of course, sex discrimination. So maybe they're, maybe they're dealing with, um, you, know, you know, women's sports, or, um, it, it, but it's designed to protect 
people from the discrimination that's, that's based on sex and education programs but may, and other activities, but it may be it may be something more you know, more broad than that, that that they're asking about. So I, I wouldn't want to venture without knowing more about the question. Via Twitter, a uh, Twitter user by the name of Native American Dave or Devi, I, I apologize if I'm pronouncing that wrong. Uh, he asks, yeah. "How will Senator Kevin Kramer help tribal sovereignty in the North in North Dakota and across the U.S.?" Sure. So, a c- couple of things. I mean, first of all, tribal sovereignty is a fact. It's not, you know, there's not a lot more it's, quote to do about it necessarily, except to enforce it more clearly. And one of the things, Rob, and this is an area, and I think a lot of the, the tribal chairs that I've, I've talked to and worked with. Um, would probably confirm this. So I've been one of those that has been a, probably more um, conscientious of sovereignty than a lot. There's, there's two things. One is when it comes to sovereignty, sovereignty for a tribe is that they govern themselves on their own issues. It doesn't exempt them from the laws of the, of the federal government or the state that they're in or the city that they might be in. Um, but how they govern themselves is left to themselves. Uh, and that creates a government-to-government relationship. On the other hand, their their members are still citizens of the state. They're still citizens of the country. They still vote in state and federal elections. And so those of us that are elected, um, they are our constituents too. And that that's, uh, sometimes gets clumsy. I would tell you this, with the, in the area, one of the areas where I've been quite a you know, strong proponent of sovereignty is in the area of mineral development, minerals on the, on the tribal land. That belong to the tribe and um, you know some people may question a particular tribal leader or t- particular tribal policy and how it treats an industry differently than another part of North Dakota to which I'd say well you know if, you know if that's where you're doing business but you know it's their mineral uh, it's their land now the, the tribe has a lot of incentives to do it right just like states do um, you know, and, and uh, so I, you know, I I'm, I honor it quite a bit, and I talk about it quite a bit, both at home and and out here. Um, but it, again, it doesn't exempt them from the other laws of, of our land and the Constitution of the United States. Um, but a lot of it is just the acknowledgement and then the, the treatment, if you will, of tribes, tribal people, and, and tribal um, governments in a way that acknowledges and respects their own sovereignty. The uh, for, for the last question, we had a couple of people ask essentially the same question. Mark on Facebook asks, what is his stance on H.R. 1044? And if he does support it specifically, why? Luke on Twitter asks, I was thinking of asking you, referring to you, Senator, uh, or asking you to ask him why he is co-sponsoring with Kamala Harris, the poorly named Fairness for High Skilled Immigrants Act. But I doubt that he would that would be productive. So I'll have I'll save that question for Representative Armstrong, who I think has enormous <laughs> potential in politics. So I, I told Luke I was going to ask you that question anyway. But but 1044 sure. Fairness for High Skilled Immigrants Act. Two questions about it. Why are you supporting that? So I, I know I not only support it, I champion it. And um, it, it was introduced by Mike Lee and myself, um, Senator Harris, and he joined us as the original co-sponsor on it. It was something I was a champion of in the House as well. And so the people understand the famous for high skilled labor, high skilled labor references people from other countries, high skilled immigrant labor, people from other countries who have high skills such as software development, engineering, medicine is a very big one. Um, And they come to the United States on what's called H-1B visa. There are all these various categories of visas. H-1B are high skilled. And, and the, the high school, um, the high school immigrants act, does Fairness for High Skilled Immigrants Act does not raise the number of visas. It doesn't raise the number of green cards. What it does is it eliminates the per country caps. So just as an example, every country has the same basic cap of how many people can get a green card. So the, the, the visas are one thing, but it's the green card which gives you more permanent status and much more um, freedom in the country to use your skills and your, your uh education, if you will, in the, in the United States of America, rather than having people just on a temporary work visa where they have to go back, you know, back to their country of origin uh, on a regular basis, their children have to go back, uh, their spouses can't work, uh, they can't work outside of their own narrow lane, if you will. 
Um, but just to put it in perspective, to get to the specific question, why do I support it? I support it because we have we we should have a merit based immigration system in this country, and right now we have a lottery based immigration system in this country. And I I believe that you ought to have a system where where the immigration system matches the demands of your workforce needs. In the high skill area in North Dakota, um, one out of twenty of our physicians, of our doctors, our medical doctors. Um, are are foreign born. They're here. They came here on, on a visa. In some cases, they have a green card. In most cases, they do not. Um, same at, at Microsoft in Fargo, for example. Uh, lots of engineers throughout the state. So we we have several thousand North Dakotans who are from places like India. Now, the green card issue, for example, India has the same cap as say Greenland. Well, there are a lot more people in India that are in the software development. That are in, you know, that are engineers or that are, that are specialty physicians, and that's the, the specialties are really where there's the shortage in rural America for physicians. Um, you know, the, 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 a lot more of them come from India than come from Greenland, obviously. So, to me, it's just a, it is a matter of fairness. It, it is a matter of tapping into the the um, incredible skills and and workforce that we gain from from H one B's visa holders. And by the way, they're some of the best people in our communities. Uh, I've known lots of them. They've been very good to me. Uh, they, several took care of my son when he was in the hospital. Um, you know, I've met with them a lot over at, at Microsoft at the foreign nationals. Have, have heard their personal struggles, and it just makes a lot of sense that we'd have more of a merit-based immigration system than the one that we have. And, and the 1044 goes a long ways that direction. But we've also put some safeguards in it, Rob, and, and this might be part of what's confusing to people. So like setting much higher um, salary standards so that so that a, a company can't recruit a bunch of folks from, say, Pakistan and then undercut their own workforce and, because that lowers wages. What we've done, Mike Lee is the, you know, like I said, Mike Lee and I did this, and what we've worked with, and we worked with Chuck Grassley, uh, chairman of the finance committee on this, is we've been able to put some guardrails in there to make sure that this bill raises everybody's standard of living and doesn't lower it. And I think that's one of the problems with past incentive programs is that they have a tendency to bring in the lower cost labor, cheaper labor rather than a higher cost labor. And that, of course, undercuts uh, American workers as well. I, I think the argument, and I don't necessarily agree with this because I, I generally agree with with your position, but I, I suspect that if, if the people asking these questions heard your answer I, I think what they would say well what about the argument which is deployed very often when it comes to illegal immigration and and some of our issues mm-hmm. at the southern border is these they're, they're coming here and they're taking jobs from americans you know we've heard right. president trump make that argument well these are high skilled jobs these are very high paying jobs you know their right. argument is well you're allowing these people to come into our country and compete with existing workers for this job how is that fair now again that, that's not necessarily a position i endorse but i imagine that's what their rebuttal would be Sure. No, and I think that I think that's a fair rebuttal, which is why we put the safeguards to make sure that that it only raises incomes, it doesn't lower incomes. They don't come in and compete unfairly. And by the way, you have to have a sponsor to have a piece of support. In many cases, we educate them. Many many times they come here for their education and their training, and first we send them back to their home country or some other country, get them, and then they be more. Um, they, they become Editors, and we are living in an economy right now, not just in Florida, but throughout the country, where we have uh, a workforce shortage, particularly in, in the discipline. Again, this is why I think we ought to have a merit based uh, immigration system rather than uh, a lottery system and, or a chain migration system. And I just met with uh, Jared Kushner about this a couple of days ago because, of course, he has been working on a bill uh, that's more broad based even than the one that. that Mike and I have been working on that uh, will include our language, so um, we're, we're grateful for that. But I've also they also incorporated incorporated some of my concerns into the White House bill that uh, you know, put some standards in for for border security and whatnot as well. That strengthens the strengthens uh, the procurement process, for example, at the, at the border, so that we can make that more efficient. So while at the same time, we're trying to. We're trying to keep illegal immigration down. We want to make sure that um, the people that are coming in here legally are the are the people that we need to to grow our economy and not not bring down wages. Kevin, thanks for your time. 
Always a pleasure. Thanks, Rob. That's it for today's Plain Talk podcast. Remember, new episodes come out most weekday mornings. Uh, If you want to follow the podcast or any of my work, you can certainly do so on social media. Search for Rob Port on Facebook or Twitter or say anything blog. The the, uh, blog has accounts as well. If you ever have any feedback on the show, email it to rob at sayanythingblog.com. Also, thank you so much to everybody who's rated and reviewed the podcast on uh, iTunes or I guess Apple Podcasts it is these days. Uh, every, Every new rating, every new review... Uh, helps boost uh, the podcast and, and helps other people find it. So if you would, um, if you haven't done so already, if you would leave an honest rating, an honest review, I would certainly appreciate it. Thanks for listening. We'll talk again.